Terrific, thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to start uh, the next session on valvular heart disease. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Vera Rigolin. Vera comes to us from uh, northwestern Chicago, and she's the current president of the American Society of ECHO. So thank you, Vera. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your weekend uh, to come here. And I just saw your beautiful simulation lab, so congratulations to Dr. Zogby and the institution for a really impressive place. So what I'm going to talk to you about is aortic stenosis. And um, I have no disclosures. And I just want to start with a thought that the more we learn, the more we realize what we don't know. And that's kind of the theme of what I'm going to talk to you about today. The more we learn, the more we realize we don't know. And I find myself saying that to myself every day because I think, aha, I finally have this. And then I realize I don't. <laughs> So let's talk about aortic stenosis. Let's talk first about the epidemiology. One out of every four patients over the age of 65 has aortic stenosis. One out of every six patients with aortic sclerosis advance to aortic stenosis within seven years. So when we look at our echoes and we find aortic stenosis, ah, the gradient's fine, no big deal. Well, it is a big deal because millennia of these people will progress. 4% of the North American population older than 75 has aortic stenosis. And as our population ages, that number is only going to increase. And about 50% of patients with mild to moderate aortic stenosis will progress to hemodynamically severe aortic stenosis within their lifetime. Now, uh, thank you, Dr. Lang, for uh, some of these uh, slides. And this one here shows you that uh, the event rates with normal aortic valves, aortic sclerosis, and aortic stenosis progressively increases. And you see here death, MI, angina, heart failure, stroke, that, uh, again, making the point that aortic sclerosis is not necessarily benign, certainly not as bad as aortic stenosis, but a, a condition that we really can't ignore. And what about the natural history of aortic stenosis? I think all of us in the room learned this graph and it's amazing that Dr. Bronwell described this in 1968 with actually a very small number of patients. And we still use this today to uh, describe what happens with our patients with aortic stenosis. And we know that there's a very long latent period where patients are asymptomatic and feeling perfectly fine. Then there's the onset of symptoms, classically heart failure, syncope, or angina and there's a precipitous drop-off in, in survival. And we know that if we operate or intervene on the aortic valve, that that um, can uh, be, that the survival can be significantly altered. And we know from Catherine Otto's data published in 1997 that a peak jet velocity of over four meters per second uh, equals a 21%, that 21% of people were alive and free of aortic valve replacement after two years of follow-up. So once the peak velocity uh, gets to be over four, um, we really have to watch our patients carefully because of the significant number that goes on to uh, have a, a surgery or some other form of treatment. So now we know that um, we have certain uh, parameters that we need to follow in the assessment and treatment of aortic stenosis. The uh, imaging really starts with the echo. And the echo allows us to assess the morphology and the severity of the aortic stenosis. And then we have to combine that with our clinical assessment. How old is the patient? What are the comorbidities? Is the patient frail? And Importantly, we have to have now the input of our heart valve team. And really, aortic stenosis is the disease entity that really introduced the concept of the heart valve team and why it's important for that group of individuals to be present. And now we have treatment options. We have surgery, and now we have TAVR. So now there's uh, common ideologies. There's degenerative, bicuspid, and rheumatic. These are the common ones. And um, here are just some examples of degenerative aortic stenosis, of a bicuspid valve, and then a rheumatic valve on the bottom, where we see that the pathology is mostly on the, uh, the tips of the leaflet. So by echo, assuming that we can actually see the valve, we can get a pretty good idea of the etiology. And it's very important because the treatment is going to matter, depending on what the etiology is. And we can't forget the aorta. 
Okay, when we do the echo, the exam has to include a good evaluation of the aorta, including visualization of the sinuses of Valsalva, the sinotubular junction, importantly, the aorta, the ascending aorta, which may require moving the transducer up an in intercostal space. And we have to measure, according to Dr. Lang's chamber quantification guidelines, measuring at the end of diastole. And here um, is an example of how, in this view, at the standard placement of the probe, we have a slightly enlarged aorta, but then we move up an intercostal space and identify a huge ascending aortic aneurysm, which would not have been identified if that movement of the probe didn't happen. And then, of course, we have quantification, and echo is critical for the quantification of the severity of aortic stenosis, and listed on the slide are all the parameters that are necessary to include in your um, echo report. And then using that data, we can define severity as outlined in this chart here. Um, and you do the best. Sometimes not all the parameters match up into the nice little categories. Um, so you have to be a little innovative sometimes to, to determine severity. But nevertheless, these are the parameters that we use. And sometimes it can be really challenging. So here's a patient that uh, came in with extreme shortness of breath. She was also having a lot of pain, so was in the ICU, flat on her back, couldn't cooperate with the exam. And here we get a peak velocity of a little over two meters per second. And when you look at this valve, you're like, that can't be right, right? So you have to integrate and put everything together. Like, this doesn't make sense with this. So we had the, uh, another sonographer go back, gave the patient some pain medications, and gave contrast. And now we have a much higher jet velocity that's more in line with what we see. So you have to integrate what you see with what you're getting with your Doppler to make sure everything makes sense and make sure that your study is done in a technically adequate fashion. And sometimes you have to be creative, like giving contrast, allow the patient to give some pain medications to allow proper positioning. And if you have one sonographer who's not as experienced, perhaps getting another one who can help out. And then we have the concept of the stroke volume. Okay, this is a concept that was really brought home by Philippe Pibereau, who described the whole concept of low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. So sometimes the numbers don't make sense because the stroke volume may be low or may be high. So in the case where the stroke volume is low, you may have a low gradient and a low peak velocity with a low valve area, and you can't tell, is, it, is this low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis because there isn't enough push to open that valve? Or is it that you just, you really truly have aortic stenosis that's severe. And we may have to get creative by doing things like a dibutamine stress echo to sort that out. On the opposite side, if your stroke volume is high, say you have anemia or hyperthyroidism, you may have a valve that's opening beautifully and the gradient is high. Well, that gradient may be high because the flow is high. So looking at stroke volume is really important to try to sort through some of these tricky situations. And this is a nice diagram that was actually put into the European um, valve disease guidelines, really going through um, a step-by-step -step approach, looking at all the different hemodynamic parameters that we can get on the echo to really come up with an, a, an appropriate uh, perception of the true severity of the stenosis. And other things to look at is the degree of calcification. And uh, we know with work done by um, uh, Raphael Rosenheck that uh, valves that are severely calcified have a higher event-free, uh, have a more chance of needing surgery or uh, proceeding to another untoward event. So having severe calcification does seem to predict survival, as does a rapid increase in the peak velocity. If it's more than uh, 0.3 meters per second in one year, the event-free survival begins to decline. So other things that we have to pay attention in our imaging. Stress testing is also something that can be very useful, particularly in situations where the valve may seem severe and the patient isn't complaining of a lot of symptoms or vice versa, the patient is complaining of a lot of symptoms and the valve doesn't seem that severe. By doing a stress test, sometimes we can sort through those tricky situations, with the caveat that you should not be stress testing patients who are clearly symptomatic, because that could be dangerous and you don't want to do that. But here in uh, DAS's uh, data on stress testing, it was shown that individuals who have an abnormal stress test 
that the symptom-free survival starts to decline. It's a little tricky, though, because this is not blinded. So of course, if you have a patient with an abnormal stress test, your likelihood of sending that patient for some kind of treatment actually goes up. So there's a little bias introduced into that. Nevertheless, stress testing is something that we use um, when, again, we're a little tricky on what we're going to do with a patient. And all of this is actually integrated into the ACC AHA valve guidelines um, in determining which patients need um, intervention. And um, particularly, we, we combine the hemodynamic assessment that I just told you about with the clinical picture of the patient to determine if aortic valve replacement is necessary. So that all seems straightforward, right? Like, we know what we're doing. But remember, the more we know, the more we realize we have a lot more to learn. And because now we introduce a whole new decision tree with TAVR. Okay, so here's some of the TAVR data. This is the partner trial, the very first partner trial, and now we have data at five years showing in the high-risk group that the TAVR and SAVR survivals are equal. Here's uh, the inter inoperable arm of the TAVR trial showing that um, patients who undergo TAVR do much better than patients who undergo medical therapy. No, no surprises there. Um, the PARTNER2 trial with the intermediate risk patient, patients, um, we see here that SAVR and TAVR uh, do equally well with one another. Um, and then we have the similar type of data with the core valve. So we have two approved uh, TAVR valves that have shown very good outcomes in patients who are prohibitive risk for surgery, inoperable, and intermediate risk. And now we have um, this incorporated into our ACC AHA valve guidelines to help us decide, is it surgical AVR or is a TAVR uh, more appropriate for patients? And the Europeans also have a similar algorithm in their guidelines. So straightforward, right? Look, how, how hard can this be? Well, again. The more we know, the more we realize we don't know. <laughs> so now we have the PARTNER3 trial, okay? So in our guidelines, low-risk patients, TAVR is not approved for low-risk patients, but the PARTNER3 trial is in progress right now, and it's looking at patients with symptomatic severe aortic stenosis who are low-risk for surgery, um, defined by the heart valve team and STS score, and they're randomized to either uh, TAVR or surgery, and with the primary endpoint, is mortality, stroke, rehospitalization, and uh, follow-up actually out to 10 years. And it's really important to follow this group out to 10 years because these are low-risk patients who are going to live a long time. So it's not good enough for us to say that at one year or two years that they do well. We want to know long-term equal to what they would have at least with a bioprosthetic valve. So long-term follow-up is important in this group. And then there's registries looking particularly at uh, bicuspid valves and the valve in valve group. So again, getting more complicated. Used to be really straightforward. At a bicuspid valve, go to surgery. You need a valve re-replacement, go to surgery. Well now, maybe doing a TAVR is appropriate. Who knows? Adding again. The more we know, the more we realize we have a lot to learn. And what's the value of the heart valve team? Okay, it's important because now we have options. So the valve team is going to determine what is the etiology of the stenosis. Is there a prosthetic valve that we have to re-replace? How old is the patient? Is there coronary disease? Is there an aneurysm? What's the STS score? What's the frailty index? Before, we didn't even think about frailty index. If a patient was really frail, they didn't go to surgery, sorry, that's all we can offer you. Now we have options. What's the patient's preference? Of course, we cannot forget about the patient. And what's the expertise of the interventionist and the surgeon in the institution where that patient is being treated? Because we have options. We have TAVR valves. We have surgical valves. We have aortic root replacements and ascending aortic root replace, uh, aneurysm replacements if, if an aneurysm is present. So we have options. Okay, again, seems straightforward. So let's talk about an example. Here's a 75-year-old man, and he, um, in 2007, underwent surgical aortic valve replacement with a bioprosthesis for severe symptomatic degenerative aortic stenosis following those ACC-AHA guidelines in 2007. 
He presented now in April of 2017 with severe dyspnea, chest pain, and prosthetic valve stenosis. He was enrolled in the Partner 3 registry for valve and valve as a low-risk patient. Remember that Partner 3 diagram I showed you that had the registry? So this is, he decided to participate in this because he really did not want to undergo redo surgery. I mean, who does, right? So it seemed like a good option for him to be in this registry. So in May of 2017, he underwent valve and valve TAVR with a 26 millimeter Sapien 3 valve. So here's his valve right after he had the valve and valve TAVR. Okay, you see here that, um, you know, the flow through the valve is actually a little bit less than if you had a, a, a spontaneous new prosthesis, because remember, this is a valve and valve. And his peak velocity was 3.7 with a mean gradient of 26 millimeters of mercury. It's a little bit high, but remember, this is a valve and valve. You're always going to get a slightly higher gradient. At one month follow-up, he felt great. Shortness of breath and chest discomfort resolved. And so everybody's patting themselves on the back, high-fiving, yay, we know what to do here. He's doing great. But then on exam, he has a 3 out of 6 systolic murmur, so an echo's ordered, and here's his echo. Okay, so the valve looks like it's in good shape. There's no paravalvular regurgitation. I don't know, maybe that flow looks a little different here through the valve. And when we get our hemodynamics, now we have a peak velocity of 4.6 with a mean gradient of 49, a little higher than what it was before. So what do we do? We get a CT scan, and he has a thrombus on the valve, okay? And here's the thrombus here. Again, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know. We thought that we were doing the right thing by the patient's preference, putting him in the registry, giving him a valve and valve, sparing him surgery, and now he gets a clot. Totally unexpected. But that's what research is for, right? We have to learn these things. And we know um, from data uh, th that's been going on now for several years that there is a risk of thrombus formation in uh, bioprosthetic valves, which is something we did not expect before, and particularly in the TAVR group. And we know that balloon expandable valves, valve and valves like our patient, and use of only antiplatelet therapy and not full anticoagulation increases the risk of thrombus formation. So he was put on anticoagulation, actually did fine. But an example, we think we know everything, and we think we know what we're doing, and we keep learning that we have more to learn as our process becomes more complicated. So in summary, ECHO is the key imaging test to assess patients with aortic stenosis. We must have a careful and accurate ECHO exam to allow the patient to proceed the right path. Aortic stenosis is a progressive disease, so don't underestimate the severity of aortic sclerosis. We need to follow these patients closely. SAVR and TAVR are now treatment options. And it's really important to involve the heart valve team to assure the correct treatment is chosen for the correct patient. And there's still a lot that we don't know. So stay tuned, and I hope to be coming back to talk to you again in the future about new developments for things that we don't even know yet that we don't know. Thank you. Thank you.